What's going on? Every buddy, you've got the card board coach here with your boy, Coach Co. And team, we've got a very special guest on the podcast here today. We've got Sylvain Cormier, Mr. Lash Wine on Instagram. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing very well. Thanks, Brendan. How are you? I'm pretty good. I actually referred to you as Lash Wine at some point during the expo, and I was like, man, I, I need to know this fucking guy's name. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say Lash Wine. It's a play on words. Uh, my French name is Sylvain, which Sil means Lash and Van means wine. So I find it's a better way for Anglophones and English people to to say my name. So that's the, my moniker online. It's been uh, it's been since my gaming days. So it's wow. Been, uh, all right, a little yeah. tidbit there. It's yeah. uh, it's. I was I was definitely not going to call you Sylvain um, <laughs> or Sylvain. I mean, I, I, this is hard, man. Now that it I know is. how to pronounce it, I'm probably not going to go back. So <laughs> good, good. No worries, <laughs> uh, man. I'm excited to have you on here uh, as someone who I spent a considerable amount of time with at the expo. And we've yeah. chatted uh, quite a bit over the course of, you know, the last, I'd say, six months to a year. Yeah, I, I want others to get to know you because you've got a pretty cool story. I mean, I, I don't even know fully your story. So this is gonna be, it's going to be a bit of an exploratory for everybody here. But recently you linked up with Slab Sharks. And yep. that's where I have saw you most recently. I also saw some of the crazy bulk buys that you've been uh, you've been partaking in. And I, every time I see one of those bulk buys, I'm like, man, this guy just just hit some goodies in there. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the Slab Shark Slab Sharks partnership or what, whatever that is. For sure. And uh, let's just go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the Slab Shark partnership started in uh, in January. Okay. Well, I mean, let's let's go back a little bit further. Is uh, when Slab Sharks had their fir first booth in November last Expo. Uh, they I had reached out to Karn a few months prior because I wanted, that was my first expo and I wanted information. I was like, do you know who I should contact to get a booth, et cetera? And he's like, you know what, bro, we're going to have uh, some, some extra spaces. We're going to have a, you know, a nice 20 by 20 booth. And if you want, I can hook you up with, with the space there. So I was like, well, yeah, it's a no brainer for me. So I ended up, uh, you know, renting a space out from their booth and uh, from there, we we really hit it off. And he saw that, you know, I was a trustable and and uh, fair vendor. And I, I asked about Slab Sharks. I'm like, oh, what if, what if I represent you guys down east? And he's like, funny, you should ask. We're looking for affiliates and we don't have anyone in uh, in Atlantic Canada. So uh, in January, I, I onboarded as uh, one of their first affiliates and the rest is is history. Now I'm I'm still uh, still rolling with them, still loyal to them. Yeah. So you're in Atlantic Canada. Where like, I am. Where? I'm in New Brunswick, in Moncton, wow. New Brunswick. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. I had no idea. What's the time there right now? Uh, it's an hour later, so it's 5.25 there, okay. uh, here right now. Yeah. <laughs> not not too late then. <laughs> no, no. That flight from the Exco must have been terrible then. Yeah, it was pretty bad. I had, uh, I had, <laughs> <laughs> I had two, I had two carry-on luggages and two, uh, um, checked in bags and i was the only one flying my spouse came with me last november and uh, you know at least she could help me with the bags but this time around i was i was myself so uh yeah they, they were all on wheels though so i managed to get two per hand and uh we uh we figured something out yeah the goal is just getting just get to the car get to the Thanks. car you know what i mean like that's all yes, you gotta yeah. do man. That's like, <laughs> totally. get to the yeah. car that's awesome agreed let's talk a little bit about your show experience um you know how and then we'll We'll double back and I want to know all about you yeah. as a clicker, but because it's so recent, let's talk a little bit about the expo. Um, yeah. how was your show experience? Did you find yourself, you know, predominantly selling, predominantly buying, a bit of both, were people mainly trading? Like, talk to me a little bit about what it was like to be behind a vendor table. For sure. Well, this expo predominantly trades. I want to say a good 80% were trades and uh uh, you know, half of those were trades and cash, okay. but I, I want to say maybe 10% of the moves I made were straight dollar sales. So I didn't sell straight up, uh, quite a bit as much as the April and November from last time, but the trades, uh, yeah, they were, they were mainly trades. One of my weaknesses is I'm a people pleaser and I do like to be fair, but I want to say a good, uh, 
I want to say a quarter of, of the trades there were kind of even trades. And I, I've definitely learned my lesson where I need to be a little bit more firm and say, look, I can't, I can't make even trades on this side of the table. Uh, so that was definitely a, a good learning experience for me. It's nothing that, you know, that's going to stop my operation or anything, but I definitely need to, uh, to learn to be a little bit more firm on the trades. So yeah, definitely, definitely more trades than, than anything. Do you, what kind of things were people trading? What kind of things were you looking for? Um, what kind of pe things were people looking at trading into maybe? Right. Well, most like my bread and butter is really young guns and future watch autos. And like you said, in one of your recent episodes, those are liquid, right? And what I like about those is that you can check recent comps when it's something very obscure where the last comp was a year and a half ago. And it's from a player that was hot back then, but might not be hot now, uh, or a, a hall of famer. Um, I find it's, it's hard to agree on a price. So what I carry, I want to say 95% of my uh, inventory is young guns and future watch autos. And I like to, I like to grade the cards, right? So that's where I get a lot of my profit and that's where I I'm able to, uh, to buy in bulk is from the profits of grading cards that I, that I eventually move. Yeah. So yeah. young guns and future watches. Yeah. I, if you're turning it, if it's a business, I, I think that that's probably the way to go. Uh, when I'm looking for cards that I'm, I, I know I'm probably going to sell in the next like six months to six to 12 months. I'm mainly looking for future watches and, and young guns. Um, sure. I, you know, even if you end up with like a really solid card that you're like, you know what, somewhere out there, I, I'm probably getting a deal here. If, if I manage to find the right buyer or the right trader for this, I find just having that inventory on hand for as long as you do, like, unless that player is, I, I, you know, like it's really hard to find a scenario where you have the right card at the right time and the right buyer or like trader in front of you to maximize the value of that card. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't blame you for going liquid. I think that, I mean, having comps for sure helps when it comes to buying and selling, especially in this world of comps. And Absolutely. it makes things a lot easier when it comes to negotiating, right? I mean, like you're yeah. like, okay, well, this is these are the recent prices for this card if I'm selling it. These are the recent uh, prices for this card if I'm buying it. And let the buyer kind of has an idea as to what they want to pay because they have access to the same information that you do. So, absolutely. And with that said, I do like to trade some of my graded stuff for raw stuff that looks gradable, right? Uh, and uh, sometimes. Sometimes that'll pay off and sometimes I'll, I'll miss something. I'd like to inspect it before, but um, I want to say I took in probably about 80 raw cards and trade for, for my slabs and um, a good 30% of them were, were gradable. Usually it's a little bit higher, but I'm in, in a, I'm in a, I'm a big fish. Well, big fish in a small pond here in Moncton, New Brunswick, where I carry so many young guns, graded young guns and future watch autos. And uh, grading here is a little less accessible than it is in a bigger city like Toronto. Yeah. So it makes sense that here I get uh, better raw cards in trade than I would uh, in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Actually. Um, it's, it's interesting. I mean, most people go the other way. Most people, they, they sell or they buy raw to sell like essentially to get, to get them graded and then sell them graded. You trade your graded for raw. Yeah. Um, obviously that's because, I mean, when you, once you grade a card, especially if it gems and I find, especially with hockey, for those people who are listening and don't actually know, like, I think hockey has one of the best markups when it comes to like it, a raw to, uh, like PSA 10, for instance, like yeah, just kind of across the board. Um, you know, especially if you look at like recent cards, modern uh, for sure, yeah. you know, modern I mean, you don't really have young guns without that's like, true. Yeah, being yeah, that's modern, right? But true. like, yeah. especially I would say in like the last like three, four years, like I mean, a Jack Hughes raw is like what 150 bucks, I think. But yeah, about. but a PSA 10 is like 550, right? Yeah, so like exactly, that's almost a, a 4x. Like yeah. very seldom do you see something like that, right? Um, in other markets, so I think that that is and and the gem rates on like those Jack Hughes are like 86, 87 percent, right? So Huge, like, yeah. Um, I think that that is definitely a smart play. Uh, it's not one that, you know, people you're actually getting less liquid by getting a raw card. You know what I mean? But it's I counterintuitive, but once you get over it, uh, it, it just, it, it makes sense, especially if you're in this for the long term. I've been reinvesting every dollar that I put in, uh, you know, back in, in 2020. So it's just, it makes sense for me instead of spending actual cash, I just, I'll trade, 
you know, like Jack Hughes, a perfect example. I bought one raw for this was before he got up to, you know, 550 yeah. uh, for a PSA 10. Let's say I, I think I paid $90 for the raw and I got it graded. It came back at 10 and uh, it, it was worth $400. Well, I traded though that Jack Hughes for $400 worth of raw cards in about five to six, five to six cards. And, uh, and then I ended up grading those and three of them gemmed. And then now my $90 plus grading fee investment was worth, you know, $800. So it was, uh, it, 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 when you let it snowball like that, you, you, you do need to be patient because it can take about three months to grade. Yeah. But uh, if you're, if you're willing to be patient and you're willing to kind of like go a little bit counterintuitive, it can be uh, quite profitable in, in terms of snowballing. I think it's great for people to hear, right? Like, cause a lot of people, they don't really want to put in the work. I, I, and so I think that's a differentiator, especially when it comes to these choppy waters, you know, you can't, consider these not choppy waters if if we just had the biggest show of of the year and 80 percent of the deals you made were trained do you know what i mean like yeah, these are i agree without a doubt and like this is something that we talked about at the show and i talked about with so many different under, other vendors as well like there wasn't any clear-cut players people were buying at this show like normally you go into an expo or you go into a big show and you already kind of know based on performance, like who everyone's looking for. Like mm. I've been at the show where everybody is looking for Matthews. I've been at the show where everybody is looking for McDavid, where everybody is looking for Ovi. Um, and you just didn't have that for any players. You didn't have that for Jack Hughes. You didn't have that for Quinn Hughes. You didn't have, have that for Elias Pettersson. Like any of the players who were hot. Yeah. Like people were still buying them and they were definitely more liquid because they were hot. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like a mad dash where you couldn't keep stuff on the table, right? Like people Very were true. still, they were picking their spots. Uh, even if you had like a Pedersen or a Hughes, people were still like, ah, you know what? Maybe I'll wait a little bit or I don't like that price or whatever the case may be. Whereas like in the past, like someone would snap that up and then they'd razz it like instantly. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it, it did throw me off. Like in, what, when I came back, I was like, man, I sold for way less than I expected. In terms of like selling, it was, you know, on, on a report card, it was like a C minus or a, a D plus for me. But in terms of networking, it was an A plus. Like the connections I made, I find every expo I go to, my networking gets better and better. So when I came home, when I thought about the dollar amount, uh, I was, I was, disappointed isn't really the right word, but I'm like, okay, this is a healthy dose, dose of reality. It's a healthy dose of what the current market is. Uh, but I also ended up giving, I, I want to say close to five figures worth of, of cards to slab sharks to auction. There's way more liquid in eBay yeah. because it's international than there is yeah. at a, at a big card show. Right. Yeah. I agree with you. I also think it's an, it's important to, to, to kind of distinguish that, there's a lot of intangibles that come that come from attending these shows. Like I'll never forget. I went to the mint collective uh, in Las Vegas in March and I was contemplating going, not going. I was like, ah, oh, man, it's kind of far. And I was like, I was, I brought a bunch of cards with me. I was like, maybe I'll be able to move some stuff down there and it'll justify like, you know, maybe the plane ticket or the cost of hotel or whatever the case may be. And I was like, you know what? I, I ended up bringing less cards than I thought I was like that I originally had planned. I was like, let me go down there to just be at the show. You know, like I'm going to bring some stuff and if they move, if it, if it moves, it moves, but I'm going to go down there just to kind of be there, talk Take to people, yeah. you know, like just, and uh, it was probably one of the best decisions I ever made because like some of the connections I made there, like have really, uh, you know, they've been, you know, pretty good friends of mine moving forward have, uh, you know, opened up uh, different opportunities for me and uh for like other endeavors as well so i think you can't really always measure it in terms of sales um and, and i think especially as this market starts to kind of figure itself out i think at the end of the day i'm very bullish on the sports cards and memorabilia space in general i think that it's probably in one of the healthiest places it's been i mean maybe ever Mm -hmm. We had everyone talking about how this is like the jumps junk slab era and, and how, you know, this is my, might, might potentially be the junk wax 2.0 era. And yet people, I mean, product is still flying off the shelves. People are still grading cards. Uh, people are still buying and at the very least they're trading. Right. And so like those right. transactions, even though they might not be cash transactions at some point, there is a cash transaction, right? Whether that be with the grading company, whether that be with, 
uh, eBay, whether that be with, you know, whoever the case may, may be, that's still money in the market. So I don't think that there's a ton of people that are outright selling all of their stuff uh, and just leaving cards and memorabilia and, and sports related things in general. I think that a lot of people that are here are probably here to stay. And as we just kind of all collectively move money around, um, yes. you know, that's, we're going to see what happens moving forward. Agreed. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. And it's funny. There's uh one of the, I've, I've bought several collections through, through this. And uh, one of the guys who I've become close friends with who lives near me, uh, I bought him out in 2021. Uh, but he, he's discovered his system, which is like, he'll grade. He loves just like getting the rush of a gem mint card. But so he loves gobbling those up and then, and then getting them graded. And then, once he has them, he'll pick a few to collect and then he moves on. The first time I bought him out, I bought everything. And then uh, a few months later, he's like, you know, I'm going to start this whole process over again. And I think it's like his third or fourth cycle doing this in the last three years. And uh, he's just been, th so, so everyone kind of has a different approach yeah. on how, what they what they like to do. And like you said, the market's still kind of figuring itself out. Uh, people are... People who are newer to the hobby, myself included, I, I consider myself new. I've, I've been in this space for a little over three years. It's not, it hasn't been that long. Yeah. Uh, so I'm still throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what works as a vendor and what doesn't. One thing I do know is I absolutely want to be a vendor and I absolutely want to uh, uh, be, be a positive space and a, a good experience for, for buyers and sellers alike. So, uh, but s some tactics I try and it, it, I think it's going to work, but it, it doesn't. So I kind of adjust course. Uh, it's a long play for me. So yeah, I'm also figuring it out as the market's figuring itself out. Right. Yeah. I'm also one of those people that just like, I love to get a gem mint card. It's uh, it's like, I'm, I try to learn the set. I try to learn the the cards in the set because I find a lot of them come up with the same issues. And so when I'm looking for raw cards, I'm like, I know exactly what to look for with this yep. card, you know, like, Oh yeah. And especially if you send in enough of them, you're like, I know exactly what like a nine is. Totally. I know what yeah. an eight is. I know what a 10 is like for the most part. I mean, sometimes, yep. sometimes you get stuff back. You're like, I don't, this doesn't make any sense to me, but um, it's, it's definitely like for me, it, it's a bit of like a, it's, it's me getting to know the set and getting to know the cards in the set, which I kind of like. Especially right. because a lot of people get to know the cards through ripping and I'd prefer to like actually know what I have. And this way, even if I skunk on like a nine or an eight or something, like the card is still worth what I paid for it versus like if I buy a box and I end up like just absolutely shitting the bed when it comes to like the young guns or like mm -hmm. that, that the, those, those players don't really pan out or by the time I get them graded, like, I mean, the card values are down exponentially. Like I'm now... I, li I like telling people that I'd rather gamble on what I like, what I can control than what I can't control. Right. So like I can control like my eyes, I can control, you know, my, the knowledge I have towards these cards, um, you know, choosing which cards to send in, which not, which to buy, which not versus like, if I just buy a box, I, there's a zero in my control whatsoever. Right. So uh, I like to, to kind of gamble on, on myself versus like gambling on the, the, the stars. <laughs> but uh, yeah. No, that totally makes sense. And I, you've kind of just articulated what I've been feeling for a long time, but never really, you know, tried articulating. But that makes a lot of sense where you gamble on yourself and not the the box or the breaker or whatever. It, it, there's luck involved in every degree where you every, do this. Yeah. yeah. So the more you separate yourself from those degrees and and bet on yourself, the the better, right? So yeah, um, yeah I, I I completely agree. Yeah. And then, and then also for me, it's like, if I, if I know the player, like I like buying a guy like six months or 12 months before he pops off. Cause I'm like, that's another thing where I'm like, I'm betting on my eye. I'm betting yeah. on like what I know about that player, that player might be coming back from injury, or I think they're going to get bumped up in the lineup or yeah. I think they just need to be traded or signed for a different team. Yeah. And uh, you know, or I'll, I'll oftentimes going into the, the trade deadline, I'll try to bet on like, who's going to get traded to like a, a better team. I, yeah, I kind of yeah. look at the standings and I'm like, okay, what are some of the players on these teams that are like probably shouldn't be on these teams and are worth like a first rounder or a second rounder that could really do well on like a Boston or a Tampa or like the, the teams that you know are going to like grab players at the deadline. Right. And uh, just capitalize off that, like that instant rush that comes from, from one of those, like a player that no one really knows about or, or gives a shit about because they play for like, right. Arizona to go to right. like an actual contending team. Yeah. Um, it's funny you say that because I had been bullish on Pedersen for a long time. I think at one point I had 15 PSA 10s uh, of, of Pedersen. And then 
I'm like, man, he's playing like last year. He was on fire. And I'm like, his prices are barely moving. Uh, I think I moved, uh, I think I moved all but like three before he exploded. And I think had this happened like two years ago, I would have been devastated, but I have less emotion and I still made a profit by grading them. And, yeah. you know, I still 2X my 2.5X my money yeah. uh, by grading them and, and moving them. But I ended up moving, I think eight or nine to a gentleman two weeks before he popped off. And uh, it, it it wasn't as hard of a pill to swallow as, as you'd realize, yeah. but uh, it was definitely like, oh man, see, I was right but that my timing was off. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that I agree. But speaking of like betting on your eye, sometimes when I get a nine, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. I'll crack it and send it back. And I want to say Always. 50% of the time it, it comes back at 10. Always, man. Yeah. Always. <laughs> and like, I'm not cracking all nines, but I'm like, no, if, I, if no, it was no. a card that I was like, like it actually happened to me once where I was like, if this card doesn't come back a gem, like I'm, I'm blind. And like, yeah. it came back nine. I was like, come on. <laughs> I was like, what yeah. are we doing here? I, I was agree. like, no, 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 no. So I cracked it. I sent it back, came back at 10. I was like, you fuckers. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, they just want your money. Like, they know. Uh, <laughs> they like, know you guys are just eating profits right now, yeah. you know? And of yeah. course, when it came back the second time, it was when uh, J-Rob was absolutely popping off last year. Right. And I, I subbed it, like, at the expo, came back a nine. And at the time, I think I bought the, the card for, like, 45 raw, subbed it for, like, 30. So I'm, like, 75 in. And it came back a nine. And I think nines were doing like 120 at the time. And I was like, mm, man, this is going to hurt my soul. Cause it was like a $700 10 or right. like 650 or something. And I was like, man, I just, I can't, I can't, this is a gem, you know? So I cracked it. I sent it back. And by the time it came back, I think it, it went down to like $400. But like, I still was like, I it was better than the 120. But totally. I was like, you, I was like, man, you guys just shafted <laughs> me. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you have to, you have to accept that this comes with the game and you're going to get shafted a few times throughout the, uh, throughout the year. And you just, you just have to roll with it. You just don't have to let it emotionally affect you yeah. too much because then you'll just give up. But uh, um, yeah, you, you can't let that affect you too much, but I, I agree. Sometimes it's just like, man, couldn't you get it right the first time? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you have enough like out there, it doesn't hurt as much. Do you know what I mean? Like if you have, a, if you, if you're subbing enough, if you're buying enough, if you're selling enough, you're kind of like, you know what, this is just like another, drop in the bucket basically you know true talk to me a little bit about your do you collect do you strictly buy and sell like do you have any pc yourself so good question i decided i think four or five months ago that i wouldn't pc anymore okay. i did really like Bo and byram so i pc'd him for a little bit um i i just pc'd also cards that i thought looked really good and uh i decided if i if i really wanted make a living out of this, which I'm, I'm trying to work towards. PCing is going to eat up my profits. I, I've noticed like gobbling up some cards that, that were for PC and then like doing the paperwork. I I'm a spreadsheet guy. Right. And then when I add them to the spread spreadsheet, I'm like, okay, well this, this is just staying stagnant. It's not gonna, uh, you know, it might not work. So I'm not opposed to eventually having a PC in the, in the future when, you know, when I do make this for a living and I have enough to, to spare, but yeah. for now I've decided uh, several months ago that uh, I, I wasn't going to PC. What, uh, what, like, what kind of things would you PC if you were going to start PCing? Well, it's funny. It's funny that you ask. Uh, I, I worked in, I, I worked in an EB games. I was a manager for an EB games when I was uh, in my early twenties and uh, I collected video games. So I think if I were to collect PC, it's it's less hockey and also like autographed framed pictures. I do like that kind of yeah. like I have behind me. So yeah. I'm like, okay, well, I can justify paying for, for decoration. Uh, but if I were to PC, it'd probably be, I'm a, I'm a sense fan. Uh, so uh -huh. it, <laughs> yeah, I figured <laughs> I'd get that. <laughs> uh, but uh, I did PC Brady to Chuck for, for a, for a while too and then i ended up moving a lot to to my friend who's also a sense fan uh the loud collector he's a he's a big oh yeah big, yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty nice. chuck collector right yeah. so uh so I, I was happy for that to it 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 felt good knowing that it was going to a to a good home right yeah so pcing right now is in my jam but i'm not i'm i'm not opposed to it once uh once i have this snowball uh big enough so i want to talk about this actually because this is something i've talked about on a few podcasts and I think that there's like a negative stigma to talking about other, other forms of collectibles. If like you're in sports cards 
and I think that's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> It's like you can only like sports cards and all of your money needs to go to sports cards and all of your attention needs to go to sports cards. And I just, I think we live in a world of, of ors when, when it could very easily be ands. And I want to encourage more people to, to dive into what else they're, they're into. It doesn't have to just be sports cards. So let's talk a little bit about your uh, frame autograph, frame pictures, talk about, yeah. you know, video games. Yeah. Uh, First of all, do you have any video games currently that that you're like this is something that that I'm like putting away or like they don't have to necessarily be graded, but like something that you're like I would never part with this or I want to reacquire this? Yeah, I, I do. So I I've recently and it's it's a slow burn, but uh, I told myself, well, I'd like to play the games that really influenced me as a child. Uh, growing up, I had I had anxiety issues, and playing video games really helped me. And I'm a French person, but I've developed uh, English quite um, early in my in my life, and I learned how to read English through playing video games. Right now, uh, obviously, my mother was like, "Okay, don't get too obsessed." They they had good kind of boundaries for and and time limits for me to play, but it was a huge passion of mine. So, uh, uh, like, I have a um, uh, the Legend of Zelda, you know, complete in box. I have that. And then I also, I played a lot of RPGs. So I have quite a few RPGs that I, I collect like Final Fantasies and Final Fantasy seven, Suikoden to games like that. I, uh, yeah, I've, I've been keeping, I, I, I've owned them for a while and I would flip video games. I, I did that for, for a while too, but then, uh, when I got back into collectibles, I'm like, okay, I'm going to buy these and, and, and keep them because they have gone up quite a bit from, when I used to yeah. deal them back in the day and I'm like, yeah, I, I'm going to keep them this time. You're, you almost made me get up off my chair. Uh, oh. <laughs> I might at some point we'll see. I, so some, some cool, cool things I want to touch on. First of all, uh, I, I love that you said that it actually helped you with English. And um, I think that that's something that not enough people talk about. My family is Portuguese. My grandparents okay. only speak Portuguese. My parents are first generation. I'm first generation Portuguese. My apologies. My grand, my my father was born there, and my mother was was my grandma was pregnant with my mother before like they landed, but they didn't speak any English when they got here. So wow. my grandparents still don't speak any English. Um, I would say I'm probably the most one of if not, I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm the most articulate English person in my family <laughs> to date, <laughs> and I honestly want to say that a lot of that is attributed to video games and and cards. Awesome. I think that I spent a lot of time playing video games, in particular RPGs like like you. Um, for me, it was like uh, I was very into like Pokemon and and okay. Yu Gi Oh and and a lot of those like card ish yeah um, games. And and also, I mean, I've got Final Fantasy back there, which is why I said like nice. I might actually get up and like I think I have I have seven, I have eight, nine, ten, ten two, twelve. Awesome. 12, two. Like I have uh, all of <laughs> all of them, and those are like things I've just kept for no matter how long it's been uh, I've just kept them no matter where I moved and so I think that that is really cool to kind of have those parallels um totally because I think that enough not enough people talk about you know maybe where collecting initially starts um or the fact that a lot of these things have more than just like a numeric value attached to them uh, you know, in some cases, it you know, in cases like you and I, like it helped with English, yeah, uh, anxiety. Mm -hmm. It was like a form of reprieve when we needed it most. Uh, you know, I know a lot like for sports cards, and I see some of the kids at these shows. I'm like, well, they're learning like valuable business tools, uh, absolutely, and, and negotiation skills, and the ability to barter, and these are all things that you know, f for a kid who might be anxious or uh otherwise you know in, in a world where we live on screens and and it's it, these are valuable life lessons that you, we probably couldn't get in a lot of other places and so speaking of the intangibles really uh kind of i mean it's something that, that I'm, I'm glad you brought up and uh, i'm excited to see you know what else you add to that collection moving forward for sure. Uh, I've posted a few on Instagram, but not all of them. I don't have much. I have, I want to say about a dozen plus. Uh, I, I only have seven and eight for Final Fantasy. I do want to get the, I think I'm a little bit older. I played Final Fantasy three, which right. is six, 
right? Uh, it's Japanese six, but three in, yeah. in our region. Yeah. I do want to get a complete in box version of that. It's a little bit expensive, but uh, I'll I'll get there eventually. But uh, I, I completely agree with what you said too. I was heavy into Magic the Gathering. Me too. And even, oh yeah. And yeah. that really taught me how to socialize. And a lot of my friends who spoke less English, I lived in a small French community close to Moncton. We'd come to Moncton to do magic nights. And some of my French friends who weren't as comfortable speaking English, when someone would approach them to trade, they'd point at me and like, do I trust him? I was kind of their trade ambassador because I was obsessed with, with the values and, and knowing what the trade values are and, uh, you know, interacting and making fair deals. So this has been you know th this vendor thing that I'm that I'm taking on, uh, even though I've I've only restarted it about three years ago, it's it really started, uh, you know, when I was 13, 14, and I'd come to town and and come to Magic Night and even interacting and and talking. I I've learned a lot of people skills, shaking hands, looking someone in the eye. You know, I I I learned that pretty young when I was dealing with adults and, and, and making trades. And uh, they tell me, Oh, look, look in the eye when you're shaking someone's hand, kind of stuff like that. So yeah. th there were a lot of intangibles and a lot of my skills, a lot of my charisma, uh, despite being anxious, uh, it, it really got me out of my shell. And it, it, it really helped me to, uh, to just, just under just business values and, and uh, a, a lot of that, it, it really helped. I love that. Have you considered uh, jumping back in and like getting Magic? A, a commander deck going? So <laughs> that's one thing. I've, I've been playing uh, Magic Arena. Uh, right. I actually streamed Magic Arena a little bit when I got laid off like four years ago, and I really enjoyed it. But uh, when people explain to me how commander works, I'm like, oh, that sounds stupid. Like, I'm not saying it is because yeah, yeah, I've yeah, never yeah, tried yeah. it, but yeah. everyone swears by it. And I am open to, to trying it out. I live next door to a TCG shop that hosts Magic Night. So I, I mean I I could I could very much go ahead and 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 learn. I've just I've I've yet to uh to do so. But yes. Very interesting when you go from like sports cards to magic. Like cause I recently started building out a commander deck. Nice. And uh you know even like some of the most expensive magic cards like guy like uh, Gaius Cradle for instance. You yeah. know it's like it's probably like I don't know three four hundred bucks US and and for some reason i'm so hesitant to buy one and like it's like like a deal break i mean you could like change <laughs> you could change your deck by having right. a guy's cradle in it but yeah. if you ask me to buy a fucking sports card <laughs> me too <laughs> i'll buy it instantly instantly i'm the you know, same way like i think bucks, sure here you yeah. go but like, <laughs> i know i'm like, like this thing that i'm going to use <laughs> constantly yeah. and like big game changer here yeah, I'm like ah, I just don't know if it can, if I can do it. Like I've seen several at shows where I'm like ah, should I do it? Should I? Right. Do it? I have the money. So I'm like nah, I'm gonna buy sports <laughs> cards. You know, so it's, it's funny uh, you say that. It's yeah. interesting. Like I've, I mean, the shell of the deck is built, but like I adding like those like key pieces, I think is gonna be the difference maker. For, like me actually accepting that, like okay, like now I've got a a pretty solid deck versus like eh, I'm just messing around still. Right. So, yeah. It's a commitment I have yet to make. So, I, I I I agree. I'm the same way with like Final Fantasy three yeah. completing boxes like what two hundred fifty dollars, whereas yeah. I'll pay a thousand dollars for a card. If uh, yeah, it's 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 funny. I, I operate the same way, and it's I thought so I was the only one. So I'm, I'm no glad no I'm... no. I'm on the same page here. <laughs> so talk to me about uh, your mental health journey. I mean, I know that you and I have touched upon this mm -hmm. really briefly, um, mm -hmm. and I think that you know, especially in November. Uh, we talk about men's mental health and, yeah. and Movember is huge, uh, has, has grown in popularity exponentially since inception. And I think that not enough spaces are available for men to talk about mental health and physical health and all, and things of that nature. And so talk to me a little bit about your mental health journey. Um, it, it's, uh, it's an important one for you and one that I know that you wanted to share with, with people yeah. who are listening, man. Absolutely. And thank you for asking. I think this is like the perfect platform to talk about it because what you're all about uh you know you're all about health whether it's physical spiritual or or mental uh so it basically it started when i was quite young when i was five years old i caught a really bad stomach bug where i i think i you know i got sick probably like 15 times in in the day but i remember when it when it first happened i I was terrified of my body. I was like, how is my body doing something that I don't want it to do? And I had a hard time wrapping my mind around that. And I, I developed like germophobia then. And it was like, I, I, and then that 
developed into uh, hypochondria. So hypo the hypochondria followed me, you know, it's been up and down my whole life. Like it's still present sometimes to this day. Started when I was five years old. And uh, even when I was six, seven, eight, like up until, you know, the double digits, I was, I was always, always terrified of, of being sick, vomiting. But I sometimes I'd scare myself into, uh, you know, into yeah. vomiting and it, it was, yeah. it was wild. And eventually my parents recognized, okay, well, you know, he, he needs to, uh, to get some, some help here. And I ended up going for therapy and I, and I got a, a lot better, but, uh, I also had like a obsessive compulsive disorder, which is, I think is quite common with, uh, with young people with anxiety and collectors. And yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> totally with collectors as well. And, <laughs> but it, my fears always had to do a lot of people have social anxiety. My anxiety had to do with like my body and not being able to control it. And I remember too seeing I, I loved movies and I watched The Exorcist when I was 12. And for the first like for the next two years, I kept thinking I was about to get possessed. It was really? ir irrational really? hypochondria. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was quite irrational. And then I'd have anxiety attacks without realizing there were anxiety attacks. And I'm like, oh, this is me getting possessed. It was, it was, it was wild. And then when I got into high school, one of my buddy's friends, uh, sorry, one of my buddy's house burnt down. And when we went and saw the debris and how sad he was, when I walked back from that, I had my first full-blown panic attack where I felt like I was leaving my body and every, like my heartbeat was, I could feel it everywhere. And I went and told my mom, I'm like, mom, something's wrong. I think I'm, I think I had a stroke. And she, she touched my hand. She's like, Oh, you have cold sweat. It might be anxiety attacks. She knew, she knew I was anxious, right? She knew I was sensitive. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so we went and saw the doctor and he's like, yeah, it's, uh, it's anxiety. And once I knew it, they were panic attacks, he explained that, well, panic attacks are usually associated with your fears. So if your fear of drowning and you're near water you can have a panic attack, my fear was my, my own self and my own brain and my own thoughts. So so it was kind of I, I was I was scared of of myself. So it yeah. was uh, it was like a yeah. self fulfilling prophecy. A hundred percent. So yeah. I was like, as soon as I thought about panic attacks, it would eventually snowball. So I I got, went for therapy again, and then I I got medicated to help with. Uh, I took an SSRI for for several years during high school. It helped tremendously. It just helped regulate uh, the the chemicals in in my brain, right? And you know, video games and magic and just being because despite being anxious i was always really bright and i was always uh you know I, I i think outside the box i'm i'm later in life i'm being diagnosed for adhd right now so it would explain why i'd think outside the box and sometimes i'd think in extremes so uh that followed me for for quite a long time and then um back in 2016 i got better i i moved to ottawa for for several years things got better it was always you know kind of like a wave Mm -hmm. And I'd have good days, I'd have good years, and then I'd have bad years. Uh, but then in, in 2016, uh, I had a really close family member, uh, immediate family member pass away suddenly. And that, uh, you know, that eventually, I found out a few years later that I had developed PTSD because I kept having flashbacks of what had happened, right? And the anxiety got quite worse because it was suddenly and because it was due to an illness, I was like, okay, I have it too. Uh, something's wrong with me. And it was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I ended up having to take a bit of time off work and uh, go for therapy. And I learned a lot of coping mechanisms during that therapy, one of them being meditation and, you know, exercise, eating healthy. And it, uh, it helped tremendously. Yeah. And uh, when I got into the hobby, I still had some remnants of that anxiety and, and PTSD and, and depression. And, uh, when I got into the hobby, I had just gotten laid off due to COVID. And um, I was like, I need, I need to find something to do. I always kind of had a side hustle. Uh, but then I'm like, okay, I need, I need a side hustle, even though I'm laid off. And when I got back into the hobby, I dusted off my eBay, I had an old eBay account. And I ended up uh, selling cards and people would message me directly and be like, Oh, thank you so much for accepting my offer. Can you please make sure to package it? Well, this is a PC, this is a grail. And um, I was like, this is giving me purpose, man. And since, since I, I had like that sense of purpose, my, like my depression got like it, it really helped with my depression uh, after, after what had happened.
first of all, I want to thank you for sharing this story um, because obviously you went through a lot and probably continue to go through a lot. And and a lot of people don't talk about the constant work that, you know, you, you said that it's like ups and downs and it probably always will be. And mm-hmm. I think for a lot of us, you know, who have dealt with stuff, I think a lot of it's in general, whether we've like dealt with stuff or not, um, it, it you know, our brain, no matter how big or small the situation is, we always think that things are, are the, like the worst possible scenario for the most yeah. part. Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, although others might not share in the same hardships that you have shared in, they, they still, they, their problems are just as big. Um, and it requires constant effort and it requires uh, upkeep and, and you're never really like a hundred percent better. But I think the thing that you touched upon at the end is one thing that I resonate probably the most with is like, when you have a sense of purpose, your depression, and again, it's not maybe it's not for everybody. I mean, but for the most part, I find that the people who have a sense of purpose, depression kind of goes out the window uh, mm-hmm. for the most part. You know, when you feel lost is when you're probably the, like at your your darkest point. Mm-hmm. And so if there's one thing that I will encourage everyone listening to do, if they haven't already, is to find what it is that they f- feel purposeful about uh, whether that's and I'm not necessarily like saying that everyone who listens right now, like should find purpose in selling cards and buying cards and buying video games and selling video games and right. any of this stuff. Right. Well, whether that's like your family, whether that's your dog, whether that's uh, you know, a passion project that has nothing to do with any of the things I just listed, right. just find something that really enriches your life and just, you know, on, 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 in, or in instances rather where you feel your lowest, I feel like you got to double down on that thing. I think mm-hmm. you got to put time and energy into that stuff that really cultivates, um, you know, that, that enriched feeling of life inside you. Totally. Yeah. I, um, I agree. It's just, yeah, we have to, you just have to keep moving, right? Like it's, it's a wild concept because, when you're there, you don't really want to do anything. You know, when you're in that spot, hundred percent. When you're crippled by anxiety, or you're depressed, or you you really don't know which way to move. I think like inaction is probably the worst thing you can do. Totally. And, and like you, you just and I'm not saying that you should never stop, and I'm not saying that you should never rest or any of those things. But I am right. saying that you have to find a way to just push past a little bit further. And once you get like you know, into the street lights, you can right. kind of see what's, what's, what's around. You're like, okay, I know where I am again. Right. Like if you're yeah. lost, you just kind of have to walk towards the light because totally. yeah, that's the I, only way you find your way back home. I agree. Like coach, there were days where I couldn't even tie my shoes. I had to go outside to bring my dog outside. I couldn't even be bothered to tie my shoes. And, uh, I was like, holy shit, what is wrong with me? I can't even tie my shoes. And the difference, if you would have known me back then and, you, and you'd see me now, this was like four or five years ago, and you'd see me now, you probably wouldn't even recognize me. And all of this happened be- because of the time I took off from work. Uh, I had caught, uh, I'd gotten a little bit behind uh, in my bills and everything. And I had completely detached from my responsibilities during the depression. So when it was time to get responsible again, uh, I, I, I got my job, I, I got my job back in December 2019. And uh, it, it was a work from home job for a while. And I'm like, you know what, I need to go into the office, interact with the world. And I decided to uh, to do so. And so I found another job in January of 2020. And then uh, three, two months later, we all get sent back home. And then three months later, I got laid off. But the thing is, is the coping tools that I had learned during my sick leave prior to that, uh, let me kind of cope with, you know, being laid off, being stuck at home again. But because of these because of this, it, it caused financial hardship. I had to end up selling my house. I owned a house that I, I used as Airbnb income as well. And then no one was renting in 2020 and 2021. So I'm like, okay, I need to sell my house. Thankfully, the I had bought in 2014 when the market was low and I sold when the market was high. And while I was packing up, I found my cards and my collectibles. And I'm like, this is what I want to do. When I got the money for the house, I, I paid the, you know, what I was behind in and I had a little bit left over and that's that was my uh, price of entry to get into the hobby and then while I was in the hobby 
I, when I started, there was still a little bit of depression and shock from COVID and, and, you know, having to sell my house that I really loved. Uh, I was trying to get over that. But then when people were thanking me and telling me how uh, fair I was and how, you know, thank you for the excellent packaging. Thank you for working with me. It really boosted me. And, and that short lived, um, I want to say that that little dip of sadness that I got from selling the house was immediately replaced by the gratitude I got uh, selling cards. And I also want to say that I'm not, ex I'm not sharing this just so people feel bad or anything. No, no, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sharing this. So if someone is in a place where I'm, it doesn't have to be exactly like, like what I went through, but if you're in a place like this, know that there is a way out. And if, like you said, it doesn't have to be cards or anything. If you work on something that you're passionate about, and it also ends up helping someone, it, it's it's the best way out. It's been a tremendous way out for me in terms of like uh, being anxious or having depression. It 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 it's a tremendous way out. And when you have someone in your corner backing you, like a therapist or someone who who understands the human mind that you can talk to, who can give you tips, it's a game changer. So I know it's scary to take those first few steps, but when you do, it uh, you, you'll you'll thank yourself. There's a few things I want to touch on there. The first being, I think everything happens for a reason. And I, I say this yep. a lot on my other channels. For those of you who don't follow Co like just the Coach Co account, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think everything happens for a reason. I think that um, I think that you dealing with your hy hypochondria or earlier, like, I mean, even in the 2017s and, and going through that like extreme low, Mm -hmm. I mean, could you imagine if you hadn't dealt with your hypochondria and then COVID happens? Right. Bro, that is, bro, that is the the peak, like yeah. hypochondria trigger that will ever, ever, ever happen on this planet. Right. There will probably yeah. never be another pandemic as long as you and I are alive. The last right. one was a hundred years ago. Right. Yeah. You can probably count on on two hands and two feet how many people were on this planet the last time there was a pandemic, right? So right. yeah, the likelihood of that happening again is extremely low, but especially for someone who had like hypochondria triggers, I think that the fact that you went through all of that work and, and you know, being triggered by, by things that were not as drastic along the way, but like having a drastic response to those things and having to come up with coping mechanisms and having to reach out to individuals and systems in order to kind of build you up to this point where, I mean, all the things you've talked about when it comes to COVID were related to like what happened to you and not what was happening in here. Right. Yeah. So like, that's an important distinction. And I think that, you know, to my point where like everything happens for a reason, like it might've been really, really bad at times, mm -hmm. you know, from five until you're 25 or 30, but that all that was all part of the story because if, if that had happened you were at 2020 i don't know what what would have happened i agree i agree i remember my sister reached out to me when the pandemic was starting and she's like how are you making out with all this i'm like thankfully i've dealt with this during my time off while you know while i was off for my depression so it, it it's like in hindsight don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the best thing that happened to me was the depression. And I'm mm -hmm. not saying if you're going through something like this, it's definitely, it definitely do doesn't feel like the best thing to happen to you, but it's definitely given me the tools that I needed to, uh, you know, step back from what is happening to me or what's happening around me. And uh, meditation was a, was, was a huge, huge game changer in terms of that. And just not taking every thought that comes in, not identifying with every thought yeah. I, that comes in, not logging yeah. into it and, and, yeah. and entertaining it. That was yeah. a big problem of me is entertaining every thought I had. Yeah. So yeah, I, I completely agree that it happens for a reason. And that's why I found my cards. And that's why, why I got into the hobby. And unbeknownst to me, we we're in the biggest boom that the, the hobby has ever seen. I had no idea. I just put my head down and started working and uh, I'm like, wow, this is really easy. Selling cards is super easy. Why didn't I do this before? Well, well, maybe because we were in a, in a huge uh, bull run, but when it came back down, I, I was still like, you know, I fell in love with this process. I had been wanting to do this for a while. I had been doing something similar as a kid. And uh, it, my inner child was, was smiling from ear to ear and was like, you, you finally realigned yourself with, uh, with what I think is, is my purpose. Yeah. And I have a similar, similar COVID story, right? Where like, and this is the, the point I wanted to touch on secondly, is that 
if you find what you like to do, what what you would do for free, um, again, like, I mean, sometimes it involves money, whatever, but like, if you just find something that you've kind of glommed onto over the course of your, your tenure on this planet, I find that eventually you'll find a way to get paid for it. And so for me, for COVID, uh, I got laid off and I didn't know what to do either. I, it, prior to COVID, I was an in-person personal trainer and that's all I really knew. I mean, I didn't have any post-secondary experience that wasn't like in the physical therapy realm. Uh, you could not mm. be face-to-face -face with anybody. I knew nothing. Gyms were shut down. Like I, completely, I knew yeah. nothing about technology and uh, I was like, I don't know what to do. And, you know, for the first time I had actually like paused my life as someone who like worked, I mean, pretty much from the time they were like 15 years old until, uh, you know, eventually when COVID happened, I think it was like 28. And I was like, I don't even know what to do with my life. Like all I've ever known was work. Mm. And I was like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to, to literally do anything I want, anything. I can learn to cook. I can draw. I can sing. I can like, what do you want to do? Right? Like we were getting like, we were getting Serb. I'm like, if I need it, I'll get it. Right? Like this is for the first time ever. I'm, I'm able to just like figure out what the fuck do you want yeah. to do? Yeah. You know? And I mean, inevitably I got back into training. Cause I was like, no, like this enriches me. Like helping others is like definitely something that is, is like a love language for me, you know, like uh, acts of service, being able mm. to help people both mentally and physically overcome things is is big for me. Um, but also I'm like my whole life I've collected stuff. And and only when I got really busy as like an adult did I stop doing that. And I'm like, well, why Likewise. did I stop? Why did I stop doing that? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and I talk a lot about like collecting many things. Like, I mean, I've collected video games. Like I said, I still have those Final Fantasy. I've I've collected magic cards. I still have my old magic cards. Uh I collected Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh and and like hats and jerseys and all these oh, cool. things that I had just kept because I just loved collecting so many different things. And I was like, you know what? Like, we're gonna get back into collecting. And like sports cards were booming. I was like, let's get back, let's get into sports cards again, you know? And um, I mean, fast forward three years, I mean, like here we are. You and I are talking about sports cards on a sports card podcast where both of us make sports card content and are contributors to the sports card space. So I think again, as much as this is a sports card and, and memorabilia podcast, I mean, what we're both trying to mention to all of you is eventually things figure themselves out. If you know exactly where you're meant to be, if you align yourself with what it is that that kind of calls to you, and, uh, you know, on this very special <laughs> November uh, mental health episode of the Cardboard Coach. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Yeah, I love and it. I completely agree. And I, I'm I'm really I, I you know, I didn't know most of what you shared. And it's it's really cool that we have that common ground. And I'm I'm, I'm honored that, uh, you know, I have this common ground with you because you're someone I look up to quite a bit when you when you post uh, stuff, mindset stuff specifically, it really resonates with me. So I couldn't be more honored to be on a mental health uh, pod, well, a, a sports card podcast, mental health version. It's, uh, it's, it's quite humbling. And I'm, I'm more than happy to be here. I'm, I'm happy to have you, man. Sylvain. Thank you. Sylvain. Yes. There you go. I got it. Yeah. Sylvain. <laughs> uh, talk to, talk to the people about where they can find you. If they're selling cards, if they're buying cards, if they're trading cards, if they just want to reach out to you about mental health, yeah. if they want to reach out to you about video games and signed pictures and whatever, how can they contact you? Uh, I'm going to leave your stuff in the description too, but I want to make sure that, that, you know, you, you give them everything you got. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you, coach. The, what I use the most is uh, Instagram. So Instagram at Lashwine, that's uh, where I'm the most active. I try to post, uh, I try to post at least two, two, three posts a week. I don't always hit that quota. I need to be a little bit harder on myself and uh, you know, a little bit more consistent with my content, but I'm, I'm off. After actively browsing it and responding to DMs. I've made a few deals through Instagram. Uh, so Instagram is definitely one. There's also my email, which is lashwine.live at gmail.com. You can reach out to me there if you have a collection to sell or if you're looking to move some cards or make a deal or even like 
anything we talked about today, I can't, I can't guarantee that I have the solution for you, but I can go more into detail about what worked for me. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to cure you or anything, but if you're going through a hard time, uh, you can definitely bend my ear and I'll be more than happy to listen to you. And I'll be more than, more than happy to offer insight on what worked for me. Love it, man. I want to thank you so much for joining today and uh, providing so much, so many valuable, valuable tidbits, not just as the sports cards and memorabilia space, but also the mental health space. I appreciate you. And uh, I'm happy that uh, myself and, and other listeners got to get to know you today, man. So I appreciate you. Appreciate you, coach. Thank you so much. All right, team. Uh, coach Cole and Sylvain, Lash Wines, out of here. Take care. Peace. Take care.